Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dewey Johnson, who's the Senior Vice President and Global Lead at Chemical Hot Analytics. Um, he is well known and his, the people, his, his company are well known, but they shifted the brand, right? Because uh, they were under another unmentionable name, but now they're part of the Dow Jones uh, system and um, uh, under the name of uh, Chemical Market Analytics. Um, I think you, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the work that his company does. They have some really excellent data and analytics around different parts of the chemical industry. Dewey uh, is one of the, the, the senior leads there. Uh, I've known him for many years, and uh, uh, he's been a speaker here at Dimension before a number of times. So, uh, so please join me in welcoming Dewey Johnson. Thank you. It's great to be here, and great to be with you. And so, let me just. Uh, Further introduction. So I, um, I'm, I'm lead the CMA team. Uh, we were previously part of IHS Market, actually legacy CMA AI, if you remember that. And um, and so uh, and I before that I spent much of my career at Eastman Chemical Company. It's, and many of my team actually came from industry and have had commercial roles. So we were um, and then uh, there was a legacy of IHS IHS Market. And then we were acquired by Dow Jones in uh, 2000 and uh, uh, let me guess now, 2021, I think. <laughs> it's been a while. And, um, and so let me just introduce the Dow Jones family quickly. So in the business to business area, there is Factiva that many of you will know. There's risk and compliance that looks at different uh, countries and uh, individuals that have been, uh, if they're, they will trace the legacy of a company or its ownership in terms of come from a sanctioned country or whatever. And then there are the newsrooms that you'll be very familiar with, uh, the Barron's Group, as well as the Wall Street Journal. And I mention that because one of the one of the opportunities we have as part of Dow Jones now is really getting uh, media coverage outside the chemical industry sector to the, the broader audience. And Dow jo uh, Wall Street Journal has um, 87 and a half million unique viewers per month. So that is a, uh, that is a uh, channel for a voice to, um, to tell a, a, a objective story. And I have found the newsroom um, is, uh, is independent. And so they provide, they will take our view and then they will test that with many others. But uh, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity and experience for the industry, I think. And so I'm going to talk today about Energy, what's happening in the energy world, and then how it affects chemicals. Let me see if I can go in the right direction. Okay, so agenda. I'm going to look a bit, little bit about fundamentals, um, what's happening, uh, what's driving the fundamentals, and then look at the major disruptors. We we'll talk about disruptors, I talk about international trade, the deglobalization, uh, energy transition, what the implications are there, and then finally, plastics, uh, the plastics waste dilemma. So let me, just a construct on the economy. Uh, and again, uh, we have two uh, critical partners that work with us. Oxford Economics does the economic data uh, outlook for us. And we take very rigorous quantified uh, views of, as we do bottoms up demand, we uh, look at GDP growth rates by country, by province, by state to really validate and verify what those growth rates look like on the chemical side and how does it compare to the overall economic growth. So you can see in this view, we do see that uh, compared to in the past, the, the uh, overall GDP growth rate globally has been around 3%. It's actually slowing down. Our long-term views are closer to 2%, as you can see. We also see a slowing in population growth. And both of those have an impact on chemical demand growth, obviously. And then just looking at energy, uh, again, Rystad Energy uh, is our uh, partner that we work with on, uh, on the energy view. This is a short-term view. We also have a long-term view. Uh, you can see uh, on a quarter-by-quarter -quarter basis in the table below, um, we see energy staying in the $80 to $90 uh, per barrel range going forward. 
a bit of an upside and a downside, but, uh, but again, in that 80 to $100 range is, is our outlook for energy, for, uh, for oil uh, between now and the end of next year. And then where are we in terms of the industry? And uh, we've talked about the cycle, so we're in the trough. On the left-hand side is this, the operating rates for some of the major uh, commodity chemicals. So obviously, olefins, ethylene, propylene. Ethylene is the top line there. It went from 92% to, uh, to the low 80% operating rate. Propylene is the black line. Again, kind of a high 80% operating rate dropping down into the 70s. And then parazoline taking a, a deep nose, nose dive driven heavily by uh, capacity additions in Asia and China, primarily with crude oil chemicals, frankly. So the, the real takeaway there, though, is if you look at, we're in the trough now, and uh, our view is, our basic case view is, it's, a, it's going to get better. Um, and so, and then the operating rates do reflect what's the rate of, uh, first of all, how deep is the ditch, how wide is it, and what's the pace of recovery? In our, uh, across all the chemicals we see basically returning to, uh, out of the, out of the uh, down cycle, but probably not until 25, 26 timeframe. On the right hand side, just as a, uh, examples, it are some of the key, uh, price markers, uh, for, uh, for some of the chemicals that basically just, uh, um, support what you see in the operating rates is, uh, uh, whether it's PX non-integrated margin or global um, ECU asset share for chloracoli units, we see a, uh, a again the margins bottom out and then begin to improve uh, next year and the following year. When we look at demand, on the left hand side is demand growth by region, and on the right hand side is by chemical. And the, the real takeaway there is. What you're going to see on energy transition, of course, as we've all known now, is energy uh, fuels demand is, has been growing at a plateau and then is expected to decline. In contrast to that, we don't see a decline in chemicals. Chemical demand continues to grow. It grows. It has traditionally grown at a multiple GDP. We call that elasticity in, in our vernacular. But um, you know, what we do see is GDP is slowing, as I mentioned before. And we see the multiple on GDP declining slightly, but again, still a very strong positive growth rate. One thing that's kind of interesting, we looked at um, the, the bubble charts represent the size of the market is the size of the bubble. So, for example, on the left hand chart, the big bubble in blue is Northeast Asia. That's the size of the Northeast Asia market in chemicals. And then on the x-axis is the economic growth, and on the right-hand axis is the chemical demand growth. And so what you see, of course, is Asia, in the last 20 years, 2000 to 20, Northeast Asia led the growth. Interesting and kind of non-intuitive, if you look at North America, which is the, the bottom blue uh, bubble, North America declined 2000 to 2010 before shale oil. And then it recovered to go back to about where it was before we found shale gas. And then uh, if you look at the right hand side, what you see is uh, the markets are going to continue to grow at Northeast Asia instead of growing at an average of eight, eight and a half percent in the last 20 years. It's going to grow at closer uh, to four percent, as I recall. So again, a, a shift in where the growth is coming. Um, India subcontinent is gray. You can see India uh, does continue to grow. Um, and, uh, and South Africa is actually small, but is a, is a major growth area as well. So where the demand will be in terms of uh, the demand centers around the world and, and where the growth will be is changing the time. Talked about this issue around elasticity. We plotted again, this is our multiple GDP growth rate. So if you look at history, it's been uh, volatile in terms of this multiple GDP. And then when you get disconnects in, um, in, uh, in economic growth, so a negative elasticity and a negative GDP meant actually chemicals actually grew. Sorry, the math is confusing. But, uh, but what we see is that on average, uh, 
chemicals as a whole grew at 1.4 to 1.5 times GDP. And now our long-term view is it's going to grow around 1.1, 1.15 or so. And then on the right-hand side is that same number GDP growth rate by, uh, by different chemical uh, in the family of cars. And again, ethylene is continuing to grow at 6 million tons a year, propylene at 4 million tons a year, um, chlor uh, chlorine and caustic, um, um, growing right at uh, a little bit less than one times GDP actually. So what's happening with international trade? So that's kind of the fundamentals. We're in a cycle, we're gonna recover 25, 26 time frame, margins are under pressure, but the world's gonna be very different when we come out on the other side. And let's talk about what the disruptors are doing. So first of all, is trade important? Absolutely. So the, uh, the stack bar again represents these major building block chemicals and their derivatives. So it's ethylene, contained ethylene, and all of its derivatives, propylene, polypropylene, um, and, uh, and other derivatives. Um, and so the bars represent the total volume of product that's traded, meaning that it's uh, consumed in a different geography than it is produced. So it's on the water. And so even though the red line shows the percentage of trade is a percentage of the market, so at one time it was around 50% of the market was traded. That's going down to about 40% of the market is in international trade. But the total volume on the water is continuing to increase. So the real takeaway there is uh, trade is critically important to the industry. The traditional model has been build where there is uh, inexpensive and available feedstock and export to the demand center. Um, so build to export. Um, and to some degree, that model is still going to be there, uh, even with uh, the issues around self-sufficiency and some of the other issues we'll see driven by sustainability measures. So the takeaway on international trade is geopol geopolitical tensions, which we talked about earlier today, uh, the different conflicts, so sanctioning of countries, sustainability pressures, whether it's extended producer responsibility, taxes on production of plastics, um, which today sits at the retailer level, moving upstream to the producer level of plastics, carbon border adjustment mechanisms, both of these represent some kind of friction on movement of materials from one region to the, to the other. And then country policies around China self-sufficiency is an example for other ESG uh, policies. All of that, the implications of all of that is the geographies separate. So today, chemicals are a very efficient commodity, right? They're separated. Prices are really separated by freight and duty and, uh, and any tariffs. What this does is potentially creates more separation in the market, increasing arbitrage between the regions, higher risk pre premium if you're going to be able to export because the uncertainty is higher, and then finally, just more opacity in the market. There's less transparency, so more risk. And we see that, we hear that with our clients. One of the obvious things as a consultant is ensuring that when we talk about a view in a base case view, that we're trying to address the risk that's, uh, that's embedded in that view. So another, so that's the uh, international trade, what the issues are there. Energy transition is a big topic, of course, and it has multi-dimensions. So this is a simplified view we have uh, with Rysted Energy on, uh, so Rysted Energy uh, does, looks at energy transition a little bit differently than some others. We look at, um, the, these are the different pathways for climate warming with the mean view of 1.9 degree warming. Um, and then we look at a 2.2 uh, uh, degree scenario, which is the, the uh, plus sigma M, a 1.6 degree scenario. And what, uh, what, so the mean view, for example, shows that we go from 100 and call it 100, 108 million barrels per day of liquids uh, production down to, to a little over 60. And then uh, the, uh, the 2.2 degree, as you can see, is around 90 degrees, sorry, 90 million barrels per day. And the extreme view of 1.6, and we have COP28 next week uh, in Dubai or, or this weekend. 
a lot of conversation about 1.5 degree uh, warming. You know, our view today is our, our base view is the, the, real, the real scenario is somewhere between 1.9 and 2.2 is the operating range that we're looking at in terms of the pathway that uh, we're likely to take. Interestingly enough, even at the 1.9 degree pathway, um, to, to achieve that, we look at vehicle fleet. Uh, and uh, the, the analysis we have that supports that is it would take uh, about 2035, 37% of the global fleet of vehicles to be electrified. And by 2040, half of the fleet would be electric vehicles. So to, even to achieve the 1.9 degree, and then obviously there's there's uh, curves on trucks and aviation and other uses, but a critical issue. So regardless of the pathway we take, the real issue that, I, that we see is what's happening to, uh, how are, uh, how's it affecting chem the chemical industry? So let me show this uh, uh, perspective and then we'll talk a little bit about what the uh, physical realities are. So, the Maslow hierarchy, uh, if you will, at the bottom is uh, effect on operations management, constraints on uh, production uh, in terms of drilling uh, emissions. Uh, and many companies are taking different options in terms of control mechanisms, renewable energy and feedstocks. Uh, and then we look at feedstock supply demand and price volatility as we look at running the plants. And then finally, what's the carbon strategy for the operation? In terms of process technology, uh, what's the product energy portfolio, and then finally its effects on, um, as we move up the hierarchy, we, we even begin to look at what's the carbon economy look like, and you know, as we move to compliance, carbon markets, carbon trading, and how that is, uh, is a part of the overall uh, uh, strategy for running the operations. With that hierarchy is the disruptors that sit on the left hand side. Big oil investing into chemicals, plastics regulations affecting operations as well as carbon policy regulation. So we see uh, certainly as we look at the geographies today, there's very uh, carbon valuations are, are mostly zero in many places with the exception of Europe. But as we see the carbon um, economy, the carbon markets maturing, we see that uh, having a significant effect on actually the competitive cost profile. So when we look at cost curves for producing chemicals, as we look at different valuations of carbon by region, it will certainly shift the, the, uh, uh, the cost curve of, of the chemical production. The other thing, as I mentioned, is regardless of the pathway we're taking, big oil is making decisions today. And examples we talked about, Saudi, uh, so we talked about uh, uh, Adnoc, uh, certainly, Adnoc, Adnoc is uh, already active in, uh, in Europe. Uh, there's a, a public uh, offer on the, on the table for brass chem in Latin America. Uh, and then the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, we, we see as they continue to push on crude oil to chemicals, liquid to chemicals today, we see them taking a significant position um, in between now and 2030, actually, uh, on multi-million barrels a day of oil equivalent into, equivalent into chemicals. And so, again, the reason for that is if you look at the uh, liquids curves that we saw previously, uh, it's a hedge on, uh, hedge on risk and diversification mm -hmm. portfolio for, uh, for uh, consumption of oil. So regardless of the curve, we see big oil investing in chemicals today, um, and at scales that, uh, whether um, as uh, you've seen in the news, Aramco has taken a bigger position in Rongxing in China. They're working with Sinopec. They're working with SOL in Korea. So uh, a lot of um, a lot of uh, planning and work underway to uh, to build investment in uh, liquids to kittens. And then on plastics, uh, the plastic space dilemma. Um, this is still a, a critical piece. And uh, if you look at where we are today, today the, so plastics is critical because 50% of global chems are consumed as a plastic. So as goes plastics, 
So goes the chemical industry to, to some degree. And today the global demand is 380 million tons per year, per year of plastics. Um, and you can see the composition. A big part of that is polyolefins, polyethylene and polypropylene, PET being the other sector. And if you look on the right hand side, it's the in use uh, sectors. And you'll see, interestingly enough, about 50% of those sectors are non durable, fast, uh, short life cycle uh, use, and then about 50% is durable. Actually, the durable application is less problematic. Think about automotive appliances. They wind up perhaps in the landfill or they're recycled. They have a clean destination. It's the non durable, the curbside waste that has been, that continues to be a bigger challenge. It also represents the bigger opportunity to collect it and, and then to process it. And so, as we've looked at that on the left hand side is um, um, a base case view of how much we see uh, what the disposition is of, the, of these different of this 380 million tons of plastic and what we see is the lower wedge is mechanical recycling effectively uh, the next is advanced recycling or chemical recycling and the remainder is either incinerated or landfilled and unfortunately a bit uncollected and um, and you know the leakage is what you worry about. On the right hand side, purely hypothetical, we said what would you need to do to get all of the non-durable plastic out of landfills and away from incineration? And what we have done is you mechanically recycle all that you can. It's the lowest cost, the lowest carbon footprint. The problem with it is it has to have a relatively clean feedstock. Uh, and it has um, it has a narrow band of fit for use uh, applications. Uh, so you you mechanically recycle all that you can. The rest has to be recycled in another manner. We're calling it advanced recycling. And you can see from our base case versus this hypothetical case how much has to be done in terms of of uh, new technology. I would say to to uh, make up the difference. And the other piece, just before we get a bit too hard on ourselves, I grew up in the chemical industry, is we've been we've been producing plastics for many, many years. It's taken many, many years to go down the, uh, the, the learning cycle, the learning curve. We build now world scale crackers, two million tons per year. These chemical recycling plants are 25,000 tons per year, maybe 50,000, maybe 100,000. We're building two million ton crackers. And, you know, we're uh, in a very large market. So the point being, uh, we're early in stage, but we're working on addressing the problem. And then this kind of tells the story. This is recycle rate of different plastics. I'll just draw your attention to the dotted line. The dotted line is the average of all recycle. So today we recycle about 7% of the total plastics produced of non-durable application. And, uh, on our base case, that will go to about 15% uh, uh, in 2050. And then in this case, this is a green case. So green case meaning that both policies uh, support uh, investment and new technologies develop. So there's an acceleration effect. But even in that case, uh, our recycle rate goes from 7% to like 23%. Uh, so that's our line of sight of where we are today and, and uh, where we're headed. Um, and Barron's, uh, Global Barron's group did a, uh, an article about six months ago on plastics recycling. I think it was pretty well done. It didn't sugarcoat the problem. It didn't criticize, it didn't, uh, you know, beat the industry up either. It just said, here's the issue and, you know, here's, uh, here's the actions being taken. So, uh, but it remains a, uh, <coughs> I think a critical issue for the industry. I know there's a number of folks here that are members of the Alliance in Plastics Way. So we're addressing it. You know, it would seem like um, at this point, you know, we're uh, we'll probably there'll probably be pressure to accelerate the the efforts. And then, actually, my last slide is just where are we now, and what's the whole new world look like? One is we talked about the cycle, the shape of it's deeper than we forecast a year ago, uh, but again, and it's widened a bit, but we do see, uh, we do think we're at the bottom. Um, 
Demand growth has slowed, um, as we talked about, but and we do see margin recovery probably in the Western markets first. Uh, in terms of unrestricted trade, as I mentioned before, is critical. Uh, and issues around such as CBAM and extended producer responsibility will bring in more uncertainty and will change the shape of the, of the, of the competitive cost curves. And that's something we'd anticipate will be dynamic because not everybody one act of carbon tax the same at the same time, it won't be the same number. Um, and CBAM certainly it will be a critical issue around that. The geopolitics, uh, it, the issues around either tariff or non -tariff, tariff trade barriers just create the inefficiencies in these big commodities. Big oil is coming. Qatar oil is coming. Uh, Aramco Sabic is coming. Um, <laughs> Um, and knock is coming in, in a more significant way than they have in the past. Uh, carbon regulatory uncertainty increases investment costs. Uh, we're, we're very early, I would say, in the carbon uh, ecosystem development. Uh, and so we, we see more of that. Um, we see more uh, um, developments occurring in that place, in that space. And then finally, plastics waste remains a global challenge. So somehow I'd like to end on a positive note. Um, chemical industry, it, we can't do anything without chemicals, we all know that. And what I have seen is no one's better positioned to, to fix the problem than the chemical industry. So, and that's my uh, takeaway to every audience is the, uh, the wherewithal to be a major contributor to the solution sits within the industry itself. <laughs>